Yeah. We're gonna get we're gonna get started on to because we have two more speakers and it's 8:35. So um, I'm Catherine, one of the second year uh, residents, or sorry, second year PGY 2s uh, first year ophthalmology resident. So just to jump into it, I'm going to tell a personal story, kind of keep my main topic uh, quite somewhat of a somewhat of a mystery first. So my story starts in the 1990s. This is me. I was one years old, sitting in Grandpa's lap. And if there's three things that you need to know about my family. Number one, <clears throat> we love Thanksgiving. Number two, we love national parks. And number three, above all else, we love watching the Olympics. And we love watching the Winter Olympics. So my story starts in 1998, and I do remember that the specific year was 1998, because it was the winter, uh, the Nagano Winter Olympics. And I, like myself, and other uh, Asian American females across the country were glued to the television screens, watching our idol, our champion. Michelle Kwan. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, my family and I would crowd around our 1985 12-inch Zenith screen analog TV, uh, you know, um, adjusting the antennas to watch NBC every night. And I remember one particular night we had watched all the uh, ladies figure skating long program and watched Michelle um, place silver next to Tara Lipinski. So that night, I remember going back to my bedroom, and I thought that my vision looked a little bit more grainy. It was kind of everywhere that I looked. Um, it, was, it wasn't that I had any visual distortions or any changes in how objects looked, but it looked like I was just looking through this clear kind of staticky fog, almost like the analog TV that still sits in my parents' house, um, with these pixelated kind of staticky vision. So of course, the next day I told my mom, and I told her, you know, I'm seeing this grainy vision, I'm seeing through it, it's not like my vision hasn't really changed, but I'm not really sure what's going on. And of course my mom, being a no-nonsense traditional Chinese mother, came up with a perfect explanation for my symptoms. And she said, Catherine, you've been watching too much TV, and that is a result of the pixels on our TV burning themselves into the back of your retina, and you can never watch TV again. And so I was unfortunately not allowed to watch the closing ceremony of the Winter Olympics. And I actually, <laughs> I actually have a memory of me being eight years old and my parents had me face away from the TV in the living room so that I could listen to the uh, closing ceremonies. And then they would tell me whenever Michelle Kwan was on the screen so I could quickly turn, sneak a peek, and then avert my gaze to further prevent damage of these pixels burning onto the back of my retina, like looking at the sun too long. Um, being a very observant eight-year-old, I also asked my mom, you know, if you think this is due to me watching too much TV, why is it that the static is everywhere in my vision, including my peripheral vision? Um, why isn't it just, you know, a square, the, the shape of a TV? Like when I look in the sun t for too long, um, I, see, I, I see a circle. Why isn't it that these symptoms are, not, uh, why is it that they're everywhere and not just kind of in a box? And of course, my mom, again, had the perfect explanation. And she said, well, Catherine, it's because you're sitting too close to the TV, and you can never watch TV again, which, of course, did not really fly well with me. <laughs> um, our story moves on to when I was in middle school. This is actually a picture of the community um, college that I learned how to swim in this pool. And my favorite stroke was backstroke. And so while I was facing on my back, um, looking up at the sky, I started noticing these very, very kind of faint floaters that slowly drifted across the sky. And as I looked more and kind of concentrated on them more, I started noticing that there were lots of floaters in my vision. Again, not really bothersome, but seemed like the more I concentrated on them, the more I noticed them. And just thousands and thousands of kind of white spots almost looking like bacteria under a microscope. So then in college at UC Berkeley, I was uh, sitting in a lecture hall learning organic chemistry. And I remember looking at my uh, professor with a well-lit podium, kind of like this one. And um, I remember looking at him, and then as I looked around the room, I would kind of see this ghost-like image almost trailing after him. And it was especially apparent when I was taking notes on a blank sheet of note paper. I would just see these kind of ghost-like images following everywhere that I looked. Um, and again, these, these symptoms weren't really bothersome to me. I never found them very distressing um, or disturbing. Um, but I just actually thought that they were symptoms that everybody felt. So then fast forward to residency, being at the beautiful Moran Eye Center. I was studying neuro-ophthalmology with Rachel Patel one evening, and I described these symptoms to her, and she thought that I might have visual snow, and that is the topic for today. 
So visual snow was first described, uh, the clear first clear description in literature was in 1995 by Dr. Liu and his colleagues when they were studying migraine patients with persistent positive visual phenomenon. They also astutely noted that these symptoms seem to be more constant and not really episodic and associated with headaches like traditional migraine with aura. And they described this as a snow and flickering similar to what was between TV channels. Uh, about 10 years later, Dr. Yeager and uh, other colleagues also, uh, this was the first um, description and use, use of the term visual snow phenomenon. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then about uh, another nine years later, Dr. Shankin and colleagues, including our own Dr. Kathleen Degree, um, were the first to systematically characterize uh, visual snow as a syndrome with proposed criteria for diagnosis using retrospective chart review, retrospective identification of visual symptoms, as well as prospective clinical characterization. So getting into the proposed and um, diagnostic criteria, um, so visual snow, usually um, it presents as this grainy pixelated vision, it's constant and usually present for at least uh, three months on presentation. Um, the presence of two additional symptoms, including palinopsia, and that includes after images as well as um, trailing images, and enhanced entopic phenomenon, which can include floaters as well as uh, seeing those thousands of white dots and lines um, on a bright blue background or blank bright white background, as well as photophobia and nyctalopia. And symptoms are not consistent with typical migraine aura, and also by definition, these symptoms cannot be explained by another disorder. So these are some photos that I really, really liked from this paper. Um, the first one shows, actually, uh, the first one shows kind of this grainy vision um, in dim light at night, and then also at room light. There's also these floaters that can be associated with uh, the part of the associated <gasps> symptoms. Palinopsias, including trailing images, as well as after images. And then um, finally, the blue and topic uh, phenomenon um, with the uh, thousands of kind of light, um, white lines or dots in vision. So if we take myself as a example, I, ha I have had these symptoms since childhood, circa the 1998 Olympics, which is when I first remember having those symptoms. Um, palinopsias, <coughs> I've seen more as after images, and then the floaters and the blue field and topic phenomenon that I described um, during my backstroke swim lessons. And then um, I fortunately have never had a history of migraines or headaches and have had normal eye exams. and. Um, for me, my visual symptoms have never been distressing. I've never really, I don't really notice them unless I concentrate on them. But just seeing patients in clinic, this can definitely be a wide spectrum for people who find these symptoms very, very distressing just because of their um, constant, unremitting um, character. And um, I'm also fortunate that my symptoms have pretty much um, almost resolved or improved over time. So <clears throat> from the same paper, demographics, um, men and women were equally affected by visual snow symptoms. 87% of patients also had a headache, with 59% also having migraine. Um, about a fifth of patients had anxiety and depression in this, uh, comorbid anxiety and depression in this study. The lifetime uh, occurrence of these uh, comorbidities have been cited as up to as high as 40 to 50% in other papers. And then um, 25, sorry, 24% of uh, patients had experienced these symptoms since childhood, and um, they were constant from presentation in 40% of patients. And a similar amount, 40%, uh, had also noted that their symptoms had progressively worsened. So pathophysiology is still somewhat of a mystery, uh, still, some, uh, still unclear, but there are a lot of new hypotheses and very exciting studies that have come out just over the last um, one to two years. Um, clinically, a pan field, positive visual field phenomenon, and the associated symptoms that I had mentioned prior, uh, suggests that there is some kind of uh, higher cortical uh, hyperexcitability. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first uh, papers that I wanted to go over um, was uh, by Dr. Shankin, um, and it showed a hypermetabolism in, a, in the right lingual gyrus, um, and as well as the left anterior cerebellar lobe, which was uh, close to the left lingual gyrus. Um, and this was done in 17 patients with visual snow using FDG PET scans. And this was uh, matched to controls uh, of patients, of healthy patients. And this is actually against convention, but this is the left side. Um, so this would be the uh, lingual gyrus on the right side and then the um, left anterior cerebellar lobe. Um, and again, this was the first kind of, uh, there haven't been any structural abnormalities uh, seen in visual snow, but this was more of a functional and uh, the first um, cited paper of an anatomic foci that could be different in patients with visual snow. 
Um, another paper uh, by Dr. Aaron showed in 18 patients compared to um, age-matched uh, patients with migraine and healthy controls that VP showed in uh, visual snow patients increased latency as well as uh, reduced P100 amplitudes. And they localized this to the visual association cortex, suggesting that there might be some dysfunction in the visual association cortex um, in patients with visual snow. I'm just moving along so we can. Um, and then the last study that I, uh, that I picked out that I thought was very interesting is that um, there was um, Dr. McKendrick did some behavioral studies with visual stimuli and different tests. And they saw that in visual snow, patients had reduced uh, contrast suppression with uh, certain testing and elevated luminance increment detection and noise. And they related that to um, some kind of, again, hyperexcitability of the occipital, uh, or, uh, occipital cortex or cortical hyperexcitability. Um, so for evaluation and diagnoses of these patients, it, visual snow is a clinical diagnosis and somewhat one of exclusion. These patients would uh, benefit from a uh, thorough neuro-ophthalmology evaluation, but things to keep in mind, um, other things like migraine with visual aura can be overlapping or uh, at least be contributing to some of these associated visual symptoms. With palinopsias, that can be a side of medication side effects, such as Topamax or Diamox. And any patient that comes in with uh, flashes and floaters, of course, should be um, retinal attachment and PVDs should be ruled out. Um, other patients with photopsias in the right clinical history and clinical setting, um, it could be beneficial to test them for perineoplastic retinal degeneration, such as CAR and MAR. And then any patient with nyctalopia, again, with the right clinical context, could be um, evaluated for other retinal, retinal degenerations and hypovitaminosis A. So treatment, mostly in clinic, uh, we've seen that reassurance is very powerful and just telling these patients that you have a benign condition, you don't have a progressive neurologic or ophthalmic disease can be very, very uh, powerful for them. And just knowing that this is not something that will progress and worsen um, has, I think most patients cope very well knowing that. Um, also, if they have associated migraines or overlapping migraine symptoms, beneficial to treat those as well as comorbidities such as depression and anxiety. Um, there aren't studies showing, evidence-based studies showing that the treatment of these comorbidities will decrease visual snow symptoms. Um, but just talking to some of our patients, getting in with a psychologist and working through their uh, depression and anxiety can also kind of dampen the overall distress they feel from these symptoms and have, help them notice them less. Um, FL41 tint glasses we recommend to our patients to, again, dampen that background static and also treat photophobia if that is associated. And then medications, um, pharmacological, uh, pharmacologic options um, have been more empiric in treatment based on case series and expert opinion. Um, but Dr. Vin Dongen um, and colleagues recently published a a retrospective, uh, kind of the first systematic retrospective chart review on treatment effects um, in 58 patients with visual snow. Lamotrigine was um, 50 milligrams POBID was the one that was recommended most often. And about one fifth of patients at least um, achieved partial remission. But a lot of patients discontinued the medication due to side effects. Um, same with topiramate. Um, however, valpro uh, valproate, acetazolamide, and flunarazine did not show any um, benefit. And if you can see here, um, all pa no patients, so, um, no patients had complete um, resolution of their symptoms. But just speaking to patients, even dampening or reducing some of their symptoms can make this a lot more tolerable. So in summary, visual snow is a pan field flickering pixelated positive visual phenomenon. It can be associated with migraine, anxiety, and depression. And um, pathophysiology is still a mystery, but there's more to come. Um, the current hypothesis that it's kind of an overexcitability of occipital cortex and visual processing. And that went blink. And also, I just wanted to, I was very excited to tell my mom that this was not a result of me watching too much TV. <laughs> Um, a special thank you, of course, to Dr. Kathleen Degree, and then also Dr. Bragunta and Dr. Patel, and um, my sources, and I will gladly take any questions for the time we have.